So we've got half a solar mass of nickel coming out, but that's we, we said earlier it was going to turn entirely into nickel. Does that mean some of it's turned into other materials? How do we find that out? Well, let's take a look at the spectrum. When in so, doubt, always look at a spectrum. Yeah, spectrum is where it encodes all the information. Now, hmm. people are not going to know what this looks like too much uh, without some, some help. So we're plotting uh, blue light, red light, and how much stuff there is. And you will see these wiggles, and these wiggles are atomic transitions. The interesting thing is what atomic transitions they are. This feature right in here is silicon. This is also silicon. Note that's not iron. This feature is calcium. That's not iron either. Is that one either? These are all things lighter. Well, okay, what else do we have? We've got sulfur. That's lighter than iron. We've got oxygen. So is there any iron at all, you ask? Well, actually there is. There's a little bit of iron in this, but it's predominantly made, it turns out, of things other than iron. There's another puzzle here, though. I mean, this is someone who spends far too much of my life looking at spectra, this is a really weird one. I mean, we've talked earlier in the course about how you get emission lines when something is optically thin, things that stick up, and absorption lines when things stick down, when you get an optically thick thing and something thin in front of it. And this seems to be a sort of hybrid of both. I mean, look at this, it's going up and down. It's a sort of wiggle, uh, up and then down, and it's similar for all these things. It seems to be a combination of emission and absorption lines. And they're also very broad. I mean, normally lines are very narrow, they're only at one wavelength, but these things are spread over some immense range of wavelengths. So let's think about how this spectrum is formed in a supernova. So I'm going to make a little uh, schematic picture of a supernova. And so, like what we talked before, we're going to have that area that we say is optically thick. That's the, that's the opaque part. And then we're going to have a part around the outside which is optically thin, which is translucent. Yes, yeah, so it's not like a star where there's like, almost like a solid surface. What's actually happening here is there's gas that's really dense and gets less and less and less dense as you go out. And at some point it becomes, the density becomes low enough that the photons can actually escape all the way to the Earth in one go, whereas further in they'd have to random walk their way out in some sense. That's right. So, of course, if we're going to look at the light coming from that opaque part in the center, then, as we found out earlier, that you get a nice, what we call, continuum from that. That's a, a featureless spectrum that typically looks like a black body. And it rises to the blue because presumably this is extremely hot. It's pretty hot, yeah, okay. Now, of course, not all of those photons come directly to the Earth. Some of them are going to find an atom, so maybe, let's just say, a uh, silicon atom that has a transition, it turns out, at about... Uh, 630 uh, nanometers, and when it does that, it may be absorbed by that silicon atom and then re-emitted, but not in the same direction. Typically, it'll go some other direction, and when it does that, that's taking a little bit of light out of that continuum. Yes, and there's a classical absorption, light, just like right. we get at the surface of the star, and uh, we got in our dwarf novae when they were in flare, so that makes sense, but it's yeah. not like the spectrum of the supernova. Right. But we have a difference here. Remember that this object, we think, had a whole bunch of energy in a ball of gas, so the whole thing is expanding. It's expanding quite rapidly, probably, given how much energy we've deposited in it. And when you take a big ball of gas, or a bomb for that matter, and you look at it after the explosion, what do you see? The further away an object is from the explosion point, the faster it's moving, because that's how it got there. Yeah, so these bits must have been going fast, got us so far out, whereas these bits have, must be going a bit slower, yep. slower being a relative term, it's still pretty fast by most standards. Okay, so that presumably means they're going to absorb at different wavelengths because of the Doppler effect. So this is going to absorb at a wavelength that's shifted to a longer wavelength, a so redshift. They're all going to be redshifted, but this is going to be much more redshifted than the absorption from Well, there. these are going to actually be blue-shifted, Paul, because they're well, coming towards us. us. Not going yeah, away, so yeah. these would be redshifted. But we're not going to see we them in absorption. We can't see them because they're behind that opaque bit. So you're, you're right. You're going to get a, a different range of things. And indeed, if we have this be the rest frame, we would expect these things to be scattered out blue-shifted towards us. But they're not all going to be at the same velocity because depending on exactly where they scatter, uh, you're going to get different velocities. So the objects that scatter out way on the outside, they're going to have the highest, uh, the, the highest velocities or the biggest mm -hmm. blue Doppler shifts. So you're saying the line would really be about here somewhere, so everything's blue shifted, and this is yep. the very blue shifted, and then the gas that's maybe a bit closer in here is going to be a bit less blue shifted, so it might be down around over there somewhere. That's right. And so 
One of the interesting features is that the further you go out, the faster the material, so the more absorption or the more uh, Doppler shift. But if you go off the line of sight, then there's a geometric effect, essentially a cosine that comes in yeah. that gets rid of the Doppler shift. So bit. presumably you're going to get um, light coming out here and it's it's moving faster than the light there, yep. but we're not see we only see the component of the motion along the line of sight, which is going to be less. So the two, I guess, will cancel out. They do. They cancel out exactly, so that on these lines, everything has exactly the same Doppler shift. So depending on where you scatter on one of those lines, you line up to a different velocity here. So you can read this off as a, as a, as a scroll, if you like. You can say, here's how much absorption there is in, so that's the fastest, that'll be over here, yep. and then going a bit further that way, you're going back to here and here and here. So you can actually tell how much absorption there is in each. That's right. So each bit lines up to a different part of the line. Parallel slabs across there. Neat. That's right. Okay, so that's part of the story. But of course, light comes not just straight through. Light can also come out trying to head that direction to a different planet, but be deviated on its way, its path. And this light uh, is, of course, going to be light that is emitted again in those atomic transitions, but it adds to the continuum. So it gives us extra emission, more or less, rather than absorption. Yeah, so if you could point a telescope just at this part of the supernova, which of course we can't, everything is much smaller than one pixel, here we'd see an emission. That's correct. There we'd see absorption, but in fact we're averaging over both of those things. And since you're seeing things from coming back this way, where there's a red shift, or this way, which is a blue shift, you get a bit of everything all centered around zero velocity in this case. And so when you add it all together, of course, uh, against all those lines, you get something that more or less looks like what we describe in our supernova as a P. Cygni profile, named after the star P. Cygni, which turns out to have a wind blowing out from it where you get the same effect, albeit not at tens of thousands of kilometers per second like we see in a supernova, but rather at hundreds of kilometers per second. So when I looked at the first spectrum and said it looked like emission and absorption lines, I was right. You're getting the emission lines from the bits out to the side and absorption from the stuff in the front. Yep. And so we can go through and we can measure essentially how fast the material is moving if we see this early on. But of course as the star or the supernova is expanding, it's becoming more dilute. Right, because you've got this big ball of gas getting bigger and bigger, which means it's, you can see further into it over time. Yeah, it's kind of counterintuitive. You'd think if something gets bigger, it would appear bigger. But of course, it's also getting more spread out and therefore more transparent. So in fact, as it gets bigger, you may actually almost appear smaller as you look at things closer and closer to the center. It can be smaller or bigger, but it's certainly going to be material that's further in and moving at a slower velocity. Yeah, so you're a race between looking further in and the stuff moving out. That's right. So if you look at it at one time and look at it a little later, you're looking further in, and so you'll see less velocity and further still less velocity. And so, so the lines could, get narrower and narrower. That's right. And so you can literally peel back the star as an onion and see what's going on if you wait long enough inside. Cool. So that first spectrum I showed you was when the supernova was quite young and sort of at its maximum brightness, where you're looking, we think, on just the outer peel of the onion. So maybe we should look at it later on, yeah, see what's inside what the What do we star. see? I mean, we need yeah. there to be nickel there. Do we see, start seeing nickel lines if we look right in the central regions? Well, here we are looking at 200 days. At this point, the object is so big that we can literally see right through the whole thing. And the spectrum has changed dramatically, and there's no you know, the calcium and the oxygen, everything's gone. And what do we see? Iron, 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 nickel, and a but little bit of nickel is away, around. Presumably, is it to... Yeah, there's not much left at 200 days. Uh, and cobalt, you just can't see in this part. You need to look in the infrared to see cobalt. And so the center part of the star is that iron that we expect, but the outer part isn't. So we need to change our story just a little bit. Okay.